<laughs> okay, so you might be wondering why I've gathered some strange materials to put on a chair in the middle of the room, but I need a volunteer to work with me. And this particular volunteer, whoever you are, um, will actually tell the group what you see me do. I'm going to make a series of movements, and you need to describe those movements, not with your interpretations, but just with your observation. So I'd like for someone to be a volunteer. Who will do it? It's really, we'll, we'll clap for you. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Great. Right. And you can, you can come up or stay back there however you like. It's, uh, you know, you just have to be able to see what I'm going to do. Okay. All right, I'm going to start. Okay. okay. You're ready. You're ready. ready. Got your eyes and your... Okay. All right. Ready to Reaching, go. grabbing for the... Oh, t say it after I'm done. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so you're going to no, tell them what I did. After. Gotcha, okay. After I'm done. But you're not going to make an analysis of it. You're okay, just, just going to give a description. Description. Yeah. Okay. All right. So he uh, brought the books and. Uh, can and everything, put it on the table. He carefully put the can in the one corner with making sure it didn't fall over. Uh, then, oh, uh, the far, the, uh, the outer corner, the, the uh, right, right, right corner okay. of, the, uh, of the chair, making sure it didn't fall off the chair okay. and balanced on. Then on the opposite, the left corner, put a little piece of tape and then, uh, <laughs> on its uh, flat side, on its uh, not rolly side, <laughs> and uh, and then put the uh, box of pencils uh, behind the can on its uh, wide side, um, bot not bottom, uh, back side. Uh, <laughs> it's um, the the back of the box side where they usually have uh, instructions and stuff. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> and then and then uh, flip the other books in a in a different direction, opposite of the the book that he put <laughs> on, a, um, on a horizontal direction, opposite of the. Books, the way they, the way they put it in the other way, with the smallest book on top and the largest book in the middle. Thank you. <laughs> so you get the idea. You get the idea. Um, I uh, typically start off my talk with um, having people think through how we talk about what we see and what we hear. Because I think oftentimes we focus on what we think we saw and heard and what we feel about that. Um, and I think it's much more complicated to talk through specifics, uh, as, we, as we noticed. You know, the specific, I, I mean, I could have really gotten into all kinds of things where, you know, it's just like with this hand or that hand or, you know, this way or that way. So I, Getting really specific when we're observing and paying attention to young children um, is a complicated matter, and it's one we should take really seriously. So one of the things I want to do today, and I think, I think this will be very interesting because you have, you have remnants in your presentation of some of what I'm going to present here, just brief, very briefly, about a protocol we're going to use um, when I'm finished with my presentation. So I'm telling you about it in advance to forecast it so that you can actually take notes, mental notes or even, even handwritten notes or however you'd like to do it, about things that I say and things I show, show you that are um, going on in the documentation. So before we get there, I'll, I'll share with you this uh, protocol. 
And um, oftentimes I say this is the stuff from Making Learning Visible, and I think it's been reinterpreted by our own group effort at the Helen Gordon Child Development Center at Portland State University, where, where I work with the teachers, um, to understand our own learning and children's learning together when we look at children's learning. So when we have group experiences where we share with one another as uh, educators and sometimes with parents and sometimes back with children, we might ask these sorts of questions to elicit particular sorts of responses. So the first question, or the what, is really what did you see and what did you hear? And, and I think um, Mara was representing it a little differently in her particular way than what I try to do. What I try to do with people at the end of at the end of my presentation, I will come back to the what. What did you see and what did you hear? And what I want you to do is to mirror back to me what you can remember of things that were directly said. So try and, you know, if you can think of a few things that I might have said or that a child might have said, write the write it down. And then you're mirroring that back to me. So you're giving me back really specific bits of information rather than your interpretation of that information. Okay, so what did you see and what did you hear is about uh, a very highly detailed, descriptive um, layering of information that I think is very complicated for us to get to as adults in children's learning. So that's kind of a slow matter. It's not something that's um, easy for any of us to follow or remember because oftentimes what people will do is they'll say I really liked blah 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 I thought this about what I saw right that's not what I'm asking for I'm not asking for you to give me your opinions or your ideas but I'm asking you for to t for you to tell me mirror just mirror back things that I've said and things I've shared with you of um, the experience that we're going to engage the second question, the so what, is what do you wonder about? And uh, if this work were exclusively um, my work with children in a classroom of my own, what I could do is I could answer your one, some of your wonderings. Some of your wonderings may actually be larger than something I could answer pretty immediately. Um, and you'll, you'll kind of begin to see that when we go through the wondering process. And what I tell people is, uh, well, there's two things. A friend of mine, Frank, and the, the first story I'm going to share with you is from Frank's teaching experience with one-year-olds and um, a year-long experience of work with one-year-olds on what happens when you make learning visible, which became our research project for four of us in the school. Um, so I'm going to share with you Frank's project. Frank uh, passed away in 2013, about five years ago. Um, and. We, we, as a group of four, decided that we could actually share each other's work. So I've been taking Frank's work around and sharing Frank's work for a, a while about this particular experience. But what Frank used to say is that this is not your passive aggressive wonderings <laughs> for Frank. Because Frank's sharing his life with you and his life with children, so their lives with you. And so uh, there are times where people want to wonder things that are really not about a wondering, but they're more about how they might have done something better than you might do something. So that's not what this experience is about. This is really about what do you deeply wonder? What do you deeply, what are you curious about in what I'm sharing with you? And that's, um, that's a, kind of a different sort of wonder. And then this last piece, um, I'm going to save until the, after the second presentation, which is my uh, portion of the what happens when you make learning visible. Um, uh, project, and that's when we'll talk about Frank's and and Frank and his children's experiences and their their family's experiences, and then my uh, experiences with Marcia and in the studio, and then the children and and the, those children's uh, families. And so, in this particular piece, we're going to just talk about what inspiration or implication do you see for your own work. Um, it's really a way for us to wrap it up um, and for you to sort of walk away thinking critically for yourselves about what you might do with any of this information that I'm sharing with you. What, what might be important for you in your work. So that's going to be our process today and again tomorrow. 
um, when I share the with the third person uh, who was involved in this project, she and I are reconstructing her work on the digital camera um, with the 12 months to 24 month olds, um, the two year project on, on digital camera work. And so tomorrow we're gonna go back through this again and follow this protocol. Okay, so with that said, I'm gonna turn to Frank's story. And this story is, a, is uh, narrated in a particular way. <coughs> I just actually close that out. Oh, good. Okay. All right. So I'm going to um, basically read Frank and the children's words. A young toddler's foot finding shared identity. A 22-month-old comes to me with a book. This is Frank speaking. Comes to me with a book and a bear. The book we've read together several times. The story is familiar to us. A boy hears someone crying, and when the page is turned, we discover that it is a bear who has stowed away in the back of a delivery truck and is lost in the city. Today, as he settles into my lap, he makes an exciting discovery. On the first page of the book, there is a clue he has not noticed before. The bear's paw is just visible in the back of the truck. He looks up at me, eyes wide, and he points emphatically at the bear's paw, his finger tapping the page forcefully. After a moment's pause, he turns, to the, he turns the bear over and points to its paw. His finger moves back and forth between the paw in the illustration and the plush bear's paw. He looks up at me, his expression now very serious, and points again. Slowly, he lifts his own foot up from behind the pages of the book, and he studies it in silence. And then points to it. My co-teacher and I are quick to recognize the learning that has been made visible. We see the connection he's making between the image and object, the book and the toy, his own foot and the bear's paw. As we continue to reflect on these images, we begin to think more deeply about the connection uh, between this young toddler and the bear. We wonder if the connection he's making goes deeper than foot and paw. Does he see something of himself in the bear, something of the bear in himself? Our ideas about, about this finding of shared identity are not spontaneous. They are developed within a context of a year-long study of the image of self and the construction of identity. He who knows others is wise. He who knows himself is enlightened. And life isn't about finding yourself. Life is about creating yourself. So these are ideas that Frank has taken into his work as he begins to study uh, self-discovery uh, self and identity with the children. Images of self exploring identity. In September, a proposal is made to the teachers of our school. Think about and study the concept of self. What this concept means to us and the children. What a child's image of self is, where it comes from, how it changes over time and across context, and how it, it is related to the construction of identity. We hold this provocation, our curiosity and our questions and we and the children set out on our journey together. We begin to notice the young toddlers in our class noticing and studying their own reflections. A visit to the Portland Art Museum surprises us all with a mirrored wall in the outdoor sculpture court. The children become deeply engaged in their interactions with their own reflections. We are struck by the serious nature of their inquiry. They don't make silly gestures or faces. Their intensity is palpable. They are engaged in a dialogue here without words, a dialogue of interaction with their own image, their own respective selves. Our own awareness is heightened. 
we become increasingly diligent about capturing these moments when children encounter and interact with their own reflections. As we collect these images, we add them to a documentation panel in the classroom. The children are immediately engaged by these photographs, lingering over them. It's an opportunity for them to reflect on their own experiences, to see them from a new perspective. To make connections and to make meaning of these connections. It is at this point that we begin to think about the many images children see of themselves in the, in the documentation that's so prevalent in our classrooms and our school. We begin to wonder about the role these photographs, these captured moments, these memories that are made visible have on their image of self and on the concept of identity. We're just ready to go out for a stroll when the children notice, as if for the first time, a panel in the hallway documenting their ongoing relationships with a very special tree. Initially, there's a moment of self-recognition as, as she softly says her own name. This is followed by the excitement of recognizing her stroller mate in the panel's photographs. She turns to her friend and calls her attention to the panel. Together, they gaze quietly at the visual record of a shared encounter, a common experience. And then her friend also points to her own image and softly says her own name. In the same hallway, a young toddler with only a few words at her disposal shares with her mother her experiences at school by sharing with her the images of those experiences. She's beginning to incorporate stories into her personal narrative that are occurring away from the familiar context of family, where all of her stories until now have been set. Again and again, we see the children using the photographs to tell the stories of their experiences. According to George Rosenwald and Richard Ockberg, Ockberg. Uh, these personal stories are not merely a way of telling someone or oneself about one's life. They are the means by which identities may be fashioned. Robin Flubish and Janine Buckner write, we all author our own life story. In constructing and reconstructing our past, we are simultaneously constructing and reconstructing ourselves. Who we are is very much created through autobiographical narratives. The book tells the story of an experience at the water table during which this boy notices another child who has no duck, <coughs> and so he gives her one. As he rereads, retells this story, we ask ourselves what story it tells him about who he is, who he's becoming, and the kind of person he sees himself as. Looking back through a collection of daily documentation pages, one has the opportunity to see, as the pages turn, a year's worth of personal growth and development, a year of individual and shared experiences, challenges and discoveries, a year of nurturing relationships and budding friendships. These images compose a narrative of change. They tell a story <clears throat> of self and identity that is not static and predefined, but fluid and constantly being constructed and reconstructed with each new encounter and each retelling of that encounter. As part of another year-long study, this of the relationships between our young toddlers and their older siblings in the school we gave the older children photographs of their younger brothers and sisters and asked them to create portraits for our classroom. 
So this is a classroom of nine. And eight out of the nine of them had older brothers or sisters in the school upstairs in, in a, adjoining classrooms where they took on this project. And then they asked um, a particular friend from uh, a child who plays with, the, with this particular group of children from that same classroom to take on the ninth. So anyway, it's complicated, but <laughs> here are these self-portraits. Here, here are these uh, older siblings making portraits of their younger siblings. Oh, and he has um, twin sisters upstairs, so they each made one for him. This small collection of portraits is displayed as part of the sibling study, but it finds its way back, it finds its way into our study of identity as well. Our thinking is provoked and our questions move in new directions. We wonder about the experiences of seeing oneself through the eyes of another. Our identities are not constructed only by the stories we tell about ourselves, <clears throat> but by the stories others tell about us. Our very concept of self is shaped by the ways in which we are perceived by others, by the stories they choose to tell about us. This idea to us, we who are so very immersed in the business of telling the stories of children, has powerful implications for what we do. A child is born a first time, and then through the long and difficult process of constructing his identity, it is as if he is born again, says Loris Malaguzzi. Malaguzzi goes on to say, in this process, he gives himself a face, a body, gestures, movement, speech, thought, feelings, imagination, fantasy. In short, the awareness of being and the means of expressing his meanness which are absolutely essential for becoming autonomous and distinguishing ourselves from other people and things. People and things we live and interact with and from which little by little we draw most of the raw material with which we create our own identity. In other words, I can't be me without all of you. That's the sort of the bottom line gist of Malaguzzi's statement to recognize ourselves, and to be recognized. But a child's most sought after goal is to recognize himself in others, and to find in others, objects and the natural world as well, parts of himself. The end. Okay, so, let's go back to our protocol. So what did you see and what did you hear in that story? Quiet group. <laughs> <laughs> what did you see, what did you hear? Say it, say it louder. Portraits of, Portraits of children from their older siblings. Yeah. Okay. All right, what else? Thanks for starting us out. <laughs> yeah. We started with seeing pictures with children doing something. Can you be specific about what? Uh, yeah, uh, looking at the uh, book for children. Okay, looking at the books with themselves in it. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> all right, what else? We saw kids looking at pictures of them looking at their own. Like the stroller mates in the hallway? Is that, what, is that the, the experience well, you're thinking of? I was thinking of the kids looking at the photographs of them um, at the mirror. At the oh, kids. looking at them, yes. Seeing themselves in the mirror reflected. But not just seeing themselves. They were, weren't they also seeing photographs of themselves, seeing themselves? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Could we say that they were looking, they weren't seeing 
maybe to be more precise, they were seeing reflections and not necessarily themselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We heard you reading the words of a colleague um, who was telling a story and reflecting on the story. Is there a particular part of the story that stood out to you? Do you want me to only say what I see or heard, or do you want me to say what stood out to me? Like, what you saw and heard. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's tough. Because the things that are standing out to me are things that are making me think about stuff. Yeah. I'll have to think about it. This is why this is hard, but let's jump in and help. So I saw a quote by Molly Goodsey and by George Bernard Shaw. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the quote? <laughs> No. Okay. Anybody remember the quote? Or one of the quotes? Mm -hmm. Your identity it's hard in the afternoon. Yeah. We've been through three of these already. Yeah. Something like the process of constructing your own identity takes forever. Mm -hmm. I, I paraphrase okay. That. okay. You paraphrase. That's all right. Yeah. I'll give you props for coming up with something there. Yeah. You don't find yourself crazy. Okay, yes, yes. You, you don't find yourself, but you create yourself. Yeah. And yes. You also said in the end, uh, which I think was interesting, you can't be, I can't be me without all of you. Mm -hmm. No. no. I, that Malaguzzi quote is worth going back to uh, multiple times. I've spent my lifetime on that particular quote because it's very, it's, it's um, filled with various ways to think about this. Uh, our, our, our construction of who we are and how we come to be. If you're a social constructivist and you follow Vygotsky's ideas um, or even late life Piagetian ideas about how we come to be, how we come to learn in the world, uh, you would do that. You don't start with the question of who am I. You start with the question of who are, who are we together. And that determines who you are, and that helps determine who I am. So it's a different structure or model than many people are used to. Um, and I've only come to that by reading your book and then spending year after year teaching my students using that book, where that book on group learning got me to figure this out. It's a really different idea to, to use an old Piagetian model of who am I and then who are you, and then who are we. That's a really different um, set of principles that I think might even be, if I could fairly say, a Western idealism of individualism. And I think if we were to sort of flip that towards collectivism, we might say, who are we together? And it's only through who we are together that I can actually have any self-determination and that's what Malaguzzi is suggesting. So anyway, let's keep going. Um, what do you wonder about? And these can be like wonderings I could never answer for you, or very specifically something I might be able to address. I'll start us off. I, um, oftentimes people wonder how Frank was sitting there and could take the pictures of the child with the with the the paw, the bear's paw, and how he could have done that. How did he capture that moment? And Frank answered that question. Luckily, I got to hear that answer a couple of times so I could remember what he was talking about. Frank kept a digital camera on his belt clip with him at all times, all through the day. And he just would take that camera. It was a, it was a clip, so he could just take it off and take pictures instantly of what was going on with children. And he lived his life with the camera, not through the camera, not through the lens of the camera, but with the camera. So what wonderings do you have about um, what I've shared with you? Yeah. Did Frank's process of writing that book involve colleagues or other people's perspectives? Writing the book. 
-hmm. or creating the, the story. The, the, the yeah. whole story. Yeah. yeah. That's yes. pretty much it's Frank's, it's Frank's work. Oh, so it didn't um, include it. it y yes, it did. So the four of us who, um, this was after Frank conducted his master's research. Um, his master's research, we wrote about it in our, in, in our third book. We have a chapter that has some of that research dedicated. Um, his master's research included the three voices of documentation, which were um, his voice and colleagues' voices in the school, the children's voice. So he was taking pictures back to one-year-olds mm. to see about their impressions, to see what they were attracted to, what they wanted to talk about, um, you know, because one-year-olds are not going to verbalize a whole lot about the pictures, but they're going to share with you, certainly, if you're sharing with them the photographs and the series of photographs and the story you have, they're going to share with you their interest, their um, disbelief, their, I mean, all kinds of things, right? So, and then he brought all of that work, the teachers, their impressions, his impressions, the children's impressions, and, and what they were doing with the stories, he would bring that to the parents. And the parents would have an opportunity in email exchanges through a, a listserv to discuss uh, and consider the documentation. That was his, his master's research. He, he said what he learned from that was symphonic, um, that documentation for him was not about a single note on a piano being played by single fingers on, you know, on the piano, but, but literally a symphonic event created in harmony between groups of people. So that's what he learned about documentation. He brought that idea to this troupe, um, and I was the designer of the, of the identity studies. Um, so that was my question to them as a group. And Frank actually um, would bring back, and then when you see my story, I would bring back the pictures to the, to the group as well. So we would work with the parents, we'd work with the children involved in our studies, and then our own colleagues in the same hallway. And then we would bring it to the troop, and the troop constructed the story. So, um, so I would say Rachel or Liz, who are the other two members of our troop, four-person troop, might have given him the Bernard Shaw, um, you, you know, like, here's a really good quote. And so then Frank would, well, that particular one actually was Frank's, but I mean, that would be an idea. So, or we might actually question one another using this, what do you see, what do you hear, what do you wonder about? When you get to the wonderings, you learn what you didn't tell. So, you know, so we can keep going on the wonderings, but that's kind of our, been our process with it. So, so what else do you wonder about? Yes? I was wondering about uh, what are the, the stage of age when, when they know it's themselves. I just saw another movie, you know, children at one age, they were going behind the mirror and looking. Yeah. You know, you know where yeah. is the, the person? So sure. when do yeah. they recognize in that process, yeah. oh, that's me? Or, yeah. Uh, um, I think that's a good question. I don't, I don't necessarily know if it's completely tied to development, uh, if it's a developmental age or stage kind of question, or if it's just each individual child might have a yeah. different so. time frame for yeah. it, you know? Um, but it's an interesting question, and I think that Frank saw some of that, yeah, too, yeah. in the early stages yeah. where they would find themselves, and it's like, who's that yeah. know, in, the, in this mirror, yeah. like at the, at the art museum? That was a huge wall of, that was a reflective mirror, yeah, so, yeah. you know, so those were really interesting moments for yeah. the children to kind of think about, who's that, and yeah. wait, we're all here, and we're there, yeah, yeah. so, yeah, yeah. This is not a wondering that that you can answer, but okay. <laughs> I wonder about the the ethical implications of providing one's own interpretations of a child to the child before they're able to kind of work with you on that. Yeah. So, like placing those images in the classroom at their level um, is really interesting, but it's also to some degree kind of forcing that third person perspective onto them mm -hmm. when they're really young. I'm curious. Um, it could, and I think that's a really good question to to s carry with you anytime you're documenting. The ethical um, and moral range of questions that come up 
I think are pretty significant. Um, you might have a different answer for that exact question if you knew the context of the children having digital cameras, which tomorrow you're going to learn about what they did with having their own digital cameras and having their own clips of time and taking their own photography and then using the photography in a different way. So although that was a different group of children, this group has also had some of those same experiences. So then how does that change? That's another layer of children understanding photography or having a language for photography that I think still uh, adds a, a different twist to that ethical dilemma. So I think infant toddler teachers in general, photographs or not, have to address that ethical question. When are you presenting back to children with children alongside of them? When are you presenting back what you might think you know of them? Infant toddler teachers have to carry that question. Um, and in the digital age, it becomes more um, intensely pronounced. So I, it is one we have to really think about. You know, I, Frank used to talk about people would ask the question, um, does the camera get in the way? I mean, that's not how they were asking. They were asking in a very passive aggressive way. That's why he talked about not being passive aggressive with the questions. Uh, when people are asking them. And your question was not that at all. I mean, <laughs> I'm not saying that. But um, people would say, you know, isn't the camera in the way of the experience? And Frank would say, never for me. I was not using the camera that way. I was, he would talk about himself as the camera. So with or without the camera, he was still having an experience. And with the camera, it changed the experience because it just does it would change the experience if you had a clipboard, right? But I think that these um, kinds of questions are dilemmas for us, for each one of us to go seek for ourselves. Would the camera get away in the way for some people? Maybe. So then you have to think about where do I limit my use of the camera? So you're bringing up all kinds of things for me <laughs> to think about. So it's a really good question, and the ethics of the digital, the digital, uh, you know, divide and ethics, and um, you know, all of the, the the this whole range of what we're going to do next with holographic imagery and walls that are made of paint that are actually OLED that allow you to actually touch the wall and change the surface of the wall. All of this stuff is coming, and children will be experiencing this in their lifetimes, and we won't have a clue because we will not have had any of these experiences. Just like when we were children, we didn't have these, right? So what are we going to do to, to um, you know, mitigate some of this, I think these, these um, inherent ethical dilemmas that, we're, that we will face and that we're faced with now? So keep, keep with that question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just want to comment on that because I think in Reggio Emilia, they treat all of these dilemmas as research questions. Yeah. So they really try not to judge or, but just to see, okay, technology is here. How does it relate to infants? Yeah. Instead of like, no, no technology yeah. under the age of three years. Ago. Thank you for adding that. I, um, I have a, a few friends who are, you know, who have looked into the research around screen time and, you know, there's so much about screen time and young children with the screens and. Um, playing games and, and um, living in an immersive world that's not the, you know, the, our world that's a designed world. Um, and people's fear about changing the child's actual physical structure in their brain. And, and you know, I say it's here. It's here. So what are we going to do with that? And I think that's some of the questioning that goes on in Reggio Milne, too, is that we have to actually be aware, cognizant, and then do, do work around this. So... It takes research, yeah. Okay, what else do you wonder about? Any last wonderings you want to get out there? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just wonder why one-year-olds should be in school. I mean, why, why are they there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a whole lifetime's question right there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, well, and if it's an inevitable, inevitable uh, inevitability that they are, like in this case they are, what are we going to do with them? 
of how do we treat school? You know, what does it mean? So, yeah. So that's an important one. Okay, let's go back. Let's go to my story, and then um, I want to check my time. What time is my time up? So. <laughs> So the time up is at three, and we want to leave some time for questions, even though now it's pretty attractive. Well, that's kind so, of what I'm doing. I didn't negotiate with you, <laughs> but that's why I'm handling this, so just so you know. <laughs> now, now that you're immersed in it. Okay, let's see. So, oh, that's the, I'm like, that's not the right time. Three. Oh, you said three. I did hear you. Okay. All right. I have some time to share mine. Um, sometimes these go long, so, and you know, it's hard to gauge the timing. Let's see. Pranks. Where's the name? There. Okay. Now, I've never done this in this particular order. Typically, we go one to twos. And then I share the one I'm going to share with you tomorrow. So I've actually, we've typically gone in the age, by the age groupings, up to the preschool, which is the group I worked with, um, three, four, and five-year-olds. But I decided I wanted to share this piece that Rachel and I are rewriting um, and, and considering for publication. I thought I'd share that with you tomorrow, because then I can get us into some different interactive work around that with you in particular especially around the digital, um, the digital technologies. But, um, so I'm gonna skip to mine, and I'm not gonna share Liz's, which is a five, just a five minute piece, um, but, um, and I'll t maybe tomorrow I'll talk a little bit about that, and um, at least share with you some of the story. But mine centers on, uh, a study of nests, which becomes a study of all sorts of things. Really, it, it, it lands in the range of identity um, because the study of the nests sort of brought the teachers back around with the children to think about themselves and who they are in the world um, at, in relationship to birds and who birds are. So, and then I spent a whole lifetime now on this whole thing with birds, all the way now to the point where what I want to tell you um, as I start this, uh, I'm showing this video clip where I've been doing it around the world. I'm not going to share it here with you because we don't have the time to do that. But um, in my work on sustainability, there's an island about 2,500 miles away from any other, any continent called the Midway Islands. And that particular, the Midway Island um, has plastic uh, lids, bottle cap lids, all through the, and all sorts of plastics on the island. 2,500 miles away from a continent. So humans have put the plastics on the ground, they go to the waterways, into the rivers, the rivers take it out to the oceans, the oceans then take it out, and this island is filled with plastic and filled with birds eating plastic who can no, these birds can no longer eat and ingest and digest food because they have plastic through their, through their bodies. So, um, so I spent this lifetime on work with birds, which was never my intention to do, but, um, but what I've said to various audience groups is the documentarian who documents the death of the birds on Midway Islands is making a movie of this. Um, and I had a chance to speak with him twice uh, my plan is to interview him because I'm interested in how he lived with the birds who were dying. I'm interested in how he would pick the bird up and photograph or video the bird as it's dying in his hands. I'm interested to know what it means to be a documentarian living with that preciousness, knowing that the birds are really us. This is about us. This is about us. It's not about the birds, it is about them and their death, but it's about us and what we've done on our planet. And so my question has been not, so, and I have to tell you, this is where this morning, I, your presentation and your piece on participatory um, documentation resonates with me to a degree. Words are always a thing for me, but I'm, I'm really struggling with pedagogical documentation because I believe documentation is about lived experience. It's, it's directly rooted in lived experience and it's not always solely about learning the ways we construct and think 
learning, what it mean, what learning means. I have some real challenges when I when I start to think about learning. I think about learning as the experience, and you know, then Dewey talks about learning is the reflection of the experience that you had. So reflecting back on that experience. So I couple having the experience as learning and then reflecting back on the experience as learning, right, as a way I define learning. You may define learning completely differently from me. But because that's the way I define learning, I cannot talk about pedagogical documentation and have it make any sense to people who think about learning differently from me. So Jean and I have had this conversation, and we've gone round and round about it, because we think about pedagogy the word pedagogy differently, and um, and I've been trying to to uncover what does it mean to document? What does it mean to be a documentarian? And that's what I want to know from a, a man who's literally picking up a bird as it's dying in his hand, and he's taking these photos of these birds, and I'm thinking about you know the children who are going to be left on our planet with all this stuff, right, in the world. And I'm thinking about what we've done with the plastics and how that's you know, destroying the birds on this island, and how this person is living in that. And then I turn back to my own everyday experiences of fun times with children in an early childhood lab school, you know, at, at Portland State, which, yeah, we've been studying about the plastics there, and the children have been studying and looking at this video, which is a very intense thing to do um, with the parents and the children. Uh, but, um, but, I think about what does it mean for me to document learning experiences. So that is a, it's a deep, resonant question for me. So I'm going to share with you what I, what I uncovered with Frank and with Liz and with um, Rachel, and then with the children and their families. At Helen Gordon Center, a group of four and five-year-olds decide to study nests in our studio with an Italian Rista um, Marsha, and me as a participant in their classroom. In the beginning of our study, children make a choice to participate and form groups to draw and represent their first ideas about nests. That's because a child brought a nest in that um, uh, he and his family had been watching in the tree just outside of their window, and the nest fell to the ground. And there was nothing in the nest, so they brought it to school to share with the rest of the children. And so this started this conversation about, can we study the, what, is, what is the nest, and you know, who lives in the nest, and what's going on? So we determined small groups to work together, uh, Marcia and I do. And um, this required thinking about purposeful scaffolding techniques. So we wanted to be purposeful in who we were putting together in the groups. And you'll see how some of that works out and how some of it doesn't. As teacher researchers, Marcia and I ask each other, if children are the protagonists uh, in these stories, who are the teachers? And what of the parents? So we wanted to hold that question. Are the parents protagonists or the teachers protagonists? Do we get to play a role? What's our role? So what role do, do we, as other people in the lives of these birds and nests, play uh, as we make children's learning visible together? So work begins by asking children to represent their thinking together. We see hands working in pencil and drawing, uh, drawing in pencil drawings, creating separate nests and birds. We ask the children how they will begin to connect their ideas together across the paper's context. What role will collaboration play in the remaking of, of these birds and nests? We find that many hands make this representation of work possible. First, a nest appears. Then, the bird goes flying over the top. As Marcia and the children and I look back over this initial work, we begin to wonder, and we wonder aloud with the children, where do the birds and nests meet up? Where do they meet up? Where do they meet up in the children's thinking, in the children's renditions? And then how can we, as co-participants in this with the children, help in the project? What do they need from us? 
as we continue to engage the children, each other, and our colleagues uh, who review our work together in the collaborative meetings where we exchange uh, our thinking on such research matters, we find that listening, collaboration, and reflection with children creates a context where ideas are valued. Together, children and teachers choose various materials to represent lifelike nests as a next step. We begin to work in reused paper, scraps of paper. We call the scraps, the reused materials, noble, noble lives of the reused materials. We want children to think about the nobility and to not just throw things in the garbage can, but think about the nobility that exists inside, inherently, in each material. So we bring out these reused materials and natural materials and other scraps and we ask the children uh, to create using these materials. So, so basically we're, we're interested in knowing uh, about what children will do and how their imagination will conjure up the idea of nest or bird. As we explore with the reuse and the natural materials, we also find that if we can touch and explore physically with live research objects, <laughs> Another question emerges for us. Where do these materials and conjured um, imagination or imagine, imaginary, uh, imaginary ideas moving from our, our critical thinking um, out from our brain onto paper or onto the table, where do these things come from? How do we deepen our sense of nest, of bird? Is the bird actually really us? How do we live? How do the birds live? What do we eat? What do they eat? As we're casting a second life onto the life of the birds, we recreate and begin to understand birds more. How do our materials help <coughs> us create? Are nests beginning to come alive through the noble lives of the reused materials? Sophie, age four, says, I put the cotton inside so the bird can sit in the soft part. This, she points uh, to the straw and the white lace part, is so that the bird can turn its head up and rest itself up to see outside of the nest and say hello to you as you pass by. You have to remember that for later. Um, our studio teacher, Marcia, writes in her, in her journal, as teachers, we keep looking back which brings in new ideas. We look back at their ideas, we look back at our notes, we ask the children to look back, and this brings in new ideas for us to keep moving the project forward. Looking then into my own journal uh, entry, at a teacher meeting, I read aloud, listening and gathering data becomes a way for us to narrate life and life experiences. So you can see where my burgeoning sense of life experience is learning, starts to come true here. Narration becomes another important step in our processing. We can attach our own life's meaning to the life of the birds as we build stories about who birds are, how they live, and what their purpose is in our existence. And then, from the kindergarten classroom, we have a visit from Renfrit, the snowy owl who helps us to think about telling stories. How can storytelling help us to understand the subject of birds and how birds live, who they are, uh, more fully? Stories emerge in words and in drawings. Lauren recounts a story using Renfred as the voice. Lauren's story, Lauren says, sorry, I went on a walk in the park an owl came flying toward me. It was a snowy and it was snowy, and my mom helped me escape the owl. It was trying to get into my hair. We don't have owls in Oregon. <laughs> well, we do, but Southern Oregon, not in Portland. Anyway. <laughs> so, stories keep emerging as we add to the doc as we add to our research, the documentary Winged Migration. Has anyone seen the documentary Winged Migration? So that had just that was just like this big aha moment for us to share this with the children. So we add that to uh, the children's research, 
I love it. They were sitting, uh, kind of like you're sitting now, and they all had clipboards, and they were watching the watching wing migration, and who we'd stop it and ask them what do they think, and they you know draw these drawings, and of course all the birds were flying in forma formation, and you know all these really fun things started to happen from from children's imagination of uh, you know what what they see happening with the birds. Um, we see birds. Uh, bird formations come to life, and then Ingrid says to us, "The grandma birds fly. The grandma birds fly first. You know, ahead of the rest." So I guess grandmas are really important, to Ingrid. Um, and we then we begin to wonder as we hear more and more stories, such as Ingrid's story about the about her grandmother flying ahead of the rest. We we wonder about um, who children are expressing in in their work on birds. So how are they connecting their expressive or creative um, renditions? Um, you, you know, what are, they, what are they sharing with us, I guess, is this question. So we started thinking together with a group of children about the theories of flying, anthropomorphism. We, we talked about that with groups of teachers. Um, family, you know, were these representations of their own families themselves as birds, um, their own self? Them flying, um, they're having their feet off the ground, having uh, really powerful experiences thinking of themselves as birds. So we keep moving uh, forward in the project, and ha um, and we um, start to hear the children talk about hatching eggs, hatching egg theories, which led us to an internet video of hatching hummingbirds. So we asked the children to watch the video and consider. Uh, again, um, these other ways birds are living and, and what's going on with the birds. And we wonder aloud, do the children see themselves inside of the, these representations that they're, they begin to make? And so you can see, you know, the, the hatching egg here is coming out. And part of our question here was, um, you, you know, is this child repre representing herself as the birdie hatching out of the egg? What does that mean? What could that mean for her? Um, and we kept asking these questions and talking with the children about their own experiences and then reflecting back our questions uh, to them. Um, so then uh, we hear this conversation happen as they, you know, move to wanting to make representation on top of their ink line drawings with um, watercolor. Um, the, these, these particular two start talking, and they say, I, I know we can make birds that play together. So they start talking about their friendships and their fights. The children work in watercolor atop of ink, uh, ink line drawings. And while they work, their relationships come to light for us. So that's sort of what we see of the children's work, is they insert themselves into their, their work on birds. And then. I walk over, um, well, I'll just read what I say. As we progress through these many stories, we see a new level of listening emerge through Terry's work um, as his work asks, it almost demands to be seen in the room, in the middle of the room. His work is shouting out to us, and, and we, almost, we just almost didn't see it. So look what's happening here. There's a creation birthing from the blank pages in his book, and that's when we ask ourselves, where does the extraordinary exist, actually, in the ordinary moment? That is, so it's an ordinary moment that Terry's having. And um, we found it to be extraordinary only when we stopped to really pay attention to Terry's golden wing, which stands out like an invisible elephant in the middle of the room, suddenly showing itself to the onlookers. Even Terry's tongue plays along in the making of this event. I mean, we've seen young children you know, together. Well, you can't hardly see it on the picture there, but he's really so intently focused on making that wing that his tongue is out. <laughs> so, um, our breath is taken away by the work that's going on all around Terry, and then with Terry making this um, particular owl. Moments in work, however, come and go. When do we stop to take notice of the extraordinary? that exists in our everyday. What does it take for a teacher to capture a moment, a simple moment such as this? Through Terry's work, teachers and children learn to pay 100% attention. 
Marcia and I start talking to the children about listening to one another, listening to each other, writing down what they're saying and doing um, more than ever before. We really want to know, we really want to understand what they're, what they're getting from these experiences. So in this particular video, so we bring the video out, we start to video record. Um, this video, Terry teaches us, now watch me, I can fly the wire around like this and the wings change direction. So he starts to figure out even how um, the, the owl might fly from the wings and the way that the wire works, he thinks works similarly to the way the wings would work for, uh, for the owl. In the midst of this video, this was hilarious, um, in the midst of Terry's video recording scene, we find another important moment. And I forgot it was there until I looked back at it later with, um, with Marsha. Oh, it doesn't look very good up there. But anyway, that's an owl. Sophie flies her owl right into the camcorder, <laughs> right into the lens. And she tells us a story about the bird that lives in her nest that says hello to us when we pass by. So she ends up taking that bird back over to the nest that she's created if you remember um, the nest that where she could turn the bird and have it sit in the white lace part and the soft cotton part to say hello to passerbyers. So Sophie continues to tell us the story. There's goop in the bird's belly made from worms. They get stirred up to make food for the baby birds. The straw pieces that are coming up from the belly, so you can see those are standing up on the table. The straw pieces coming up from the belly stirs up the food. She'll need this while she's in their net, while she's in her nest, resting there, waiting to say hello to you as you pass by. <laughs> she's really intent about telling us that story. So um, in, in the end for us, uh, as I wrap up this story, I have a couple of ideas that come to mind. Our final rendition of birds lead us back to nesting, where the children start a discussion about where birds live in the city. So the birds in the city, because the schools in the city, might be, um, might show up differently than where the birds would live if they live out in the trees and the nests. So the, the urban roosts becomes a, a new really popular study in the next study that we end up doing, Marsh and I end up doing, we don't bring into this particular study. The children continue onward in their study, um, which finally transforms into the urban roosts, and the birds fade into the background for this particular group of children. But um, little did this group know that the two-year-olds downstairs were coming up and watching the documentation unfold against the walls of, of the, um, this particular threes, fours, and fives wing of the school, um, of, of the bird study, and they wanted to know more. So the two-year-olds were asking their teachers to learn more about the birds um, up with the three, fours, and fives. So the two-year-olds met up with the bird watchers, and they began to study birds and made bird feeders and, um, and cloth birds, and now, uh, this many years later, you still have the cloth birds in the school. You still have the bird study up um, in the school. It's, uh, it's in a different location than where the classrooms are, but the birds are still all over. So parents got involved. Martine's mother says, Martine and I went to the beach so that he could see the seagulls. He knew um, they were birds, and we could talk more about what he was learning in the studio. I got excited to spend time with him at the beach in this particular way. The study, we felt, ultimately crossed boundaries, created a revisitation, and pollinated further research into birds in the school. Many of the trails and traces can be seen throughout the school today, and now that's results in the whole study that's um, quite different about the birds swallowing the plastics and not living. In looking back and projecting forward, I think the representational thinking, the group learning experiences, the tie-in between classroom, parent, child, creative learning experience, and visual representations with the studio teacher, Marcia, is reaching beyond the borders of the school. While I feel a protective membrane between the school and the home, and the school and the community, I know there is a crossover involving an exchange of ideas, which is shaping the way teachers, children, and families work between their worlds. It's now entering into the community. So we've had community participants actually asking about the documentation and wanting us to share it more publicly. Whoa, the, the meaning of holes. The image of the competent child changes the substance of the image of the teacher. Who are we as teachers is co-determined by who we see children as. As we take note of children's competence, we, teachers, reframe our approach and our engagement in their schoolwork, their material usage, 
what we ask them to look for and think about and create. We also slow ourselves down enough to pay attention to our own thoughts, words, and commitments of every day. These notions make me think of Marsh's and my experience with Terry and the, and the owl uh, wing he colored out of Kraypaw. In slowing down to listen, we had a focused moment. I decided not to interrupt Terry's process too much. Just a couple pictures. In the moment of, of making my decision to watch and listen silently, I felt as if my brain and my eyes rapidly came into focus, similarly to an out of focus film reel or a fuzzy picture when suddenly unblurred. I take a step back from Terry's work. I finally see his consideration of his owl uh, as he's creating it in whole. The whole consideration of the moment comes to me rather than in parts. I see Terry. I see a book with a flying owl picture with the left wings spread out. And I notice a sketched out uh, golden circle with a large oblong shaped golden outline stretched out to the left. Terry's drawing an incredible portrait of this picture of the flying owl. I simply stand there in amazement, unable to respond at first. I didn't immediately go for the camera. Then I realized, go for the camera. <laughs> Start to ask questions. I grab the camera, take several pictures, and I ask Marsha to come over and see Terry's work. I ask other children to come over and ask Terry questions. His extraordinary moment in the middle of the room is found. It silently gazed at us and asked us to be seen. We were finally paying attention. And we remember that the extraordinary exists in our everyday moments of time. They become extraordinary when we slow down and pay attention to the meaning in the moment. Our, our understanding shifts. We engage intersubjectively between, between parties, between minds, in the moments between moments, even, with each other's work. And like a gestalt moment, we instantly find the whole meaning of our life's experience from Terry and his owl, and also from Sophie. So in my closing remarks, the image of the child at the Opal School Symposium, Judy Graves, informs me that she sees children as conduits of energy and ideas, conduits of energy and ideas, rather than empty vessels seeking knowledge. If this is a more authentic expression of the image of the child, in schools, we have to think about what that image means for us. If competent children are there with us, how do we respond in solidarity? How do we relate with them? We must be researchers, co-learners, listeners, documenters, collaborators, a person who reflects on teaching and learning together, maybe even as one idea, teaching learning. So what are these other images? The image of the parent, the school, society, these questions must be examined and answered in many ways through the considerate act of listening carefully for precious moments in everyday experiences with these characters, like Terry's owl, like Sophie's owl, and in our spaces. This way of listening in our teaching and learning experiences is hard. It's not something we can accomplish overnight. We can't expect to always be in the zone of listening. How many of you have zoned out at various points when I'm talking? Right? <laughs> However, we see that the child is competent. We can remember that. We can remember they're competent right in front of us. Every child. It doesn't matter who they are. And then we can act. We can relate in solidarity. We can relate in their competence as co-teachers for us to teach us. We must ask ourselves, how can we listen even when it's hard to stay focused? This is an important question because the image of the child shifts the image of the teacher. And when we practice and engage our acts of listening and looking deeply for the extra ordinary, <clears throat> in the ordinary, such as in Terry's owl and in Sophie's owl work, we will learn how to fly. So what if we could change the world's image of childhood one city at a time? This is a really different idea. Um, this is about the politics now. This is about the geopolitical level of children as competent citizens on our planet now. Not for their future life, not for what they're going to do next, not for what they're going to do in first grade, but for right now, who they are living with us on this planet. What if we could change the image of childhood one city at a time? What if we could create an installation where we could share our world with parents, community, grocery store, restaurant owners, politicians, business leaders of the children's work right now? 
Children live as full participants and intelligent citizens with us already. How can that be known? If we attempt to show their everyday moments is what I think. If we attempt to show their everyday moments, that preciousness of learning, what is learning? When we come to that and we share that and make it visible, then their lives can be recognized and valued. So I want to share one last piece with you. Um, this comes out of the 100 Languages of Children exhibit book. And um, this ends the story, but it's about a collection of ideas. On the walls, everywhere, there are these big signs, like advertising signs. The teachers call them panels. This is a seven, uh, six-year-old, I guess it is, six-year-old in one of the Regio schools. They're very interesting for everybody. The people who come here and parents, too. That is for everybody who knows how to read. Uh, there are some that we're interested in, too, like the panels of the lunch helpers, the ones that are nice to look at with nice drawings and photographs that remind us of all the things we used to do. They're used for memory so that our parents can see what we do, what we do in school. The teachers write stuff and put up the kids' ideas so everybody knows that children are intelligent. There are also ideas from kids a lot of years ago and we go, and, uh, who go to elementary school now. I mean, it's like a collection of ideas. And that's the end of my story. <laughs>